Uh, I just wonder if I can uh, just interject there for a second. Jennifer, your microphone is on mute. We cannot hear what you are saying. You'll need to unmute to get started. Hi, everyone. We're just waiting a few minutes for the last few people to join and, uh, and then we'll get started. Uh, Jennifer, you good to go if you like? Excellent. Thanks, Amy. I can't hear you though. Um, Rivka, can you hear me? Okay, so Rivka can hear me. Um, any of the participants, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay. Apologies, everyone. If you could just bear with me, we're having a few technical issues. It won't be a moment. No, that's okay. I can hear you now, Jen. Oh, you can? Okay. Yep. Sorry. Right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, and welcome to uh, our first of, of two part sessions with uh, Rivka Hagen. Today's topic is uh, around PIPQIs and incentive in Indigenous health uh, initiatives. My name is Jen Rausch. I am the quality improvement and development lead, or sorry, reform lead at the primary care team or in the primary care team at Brisbane North PHN. Um, I will um, just run through a few housekeeping and then it's over to Rivka for what we're hoping is going to be a very interactive uh, session. So if I can first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am at the moment, which is the Terrible and Yagara people of Brisbane. And we also acknowledge the Gubby Gubby people of Caboolture and Braby Island, the Waka Waka people of Kilcoy and the Ningi Ningi people of Redcliffe. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future for they hold the memories, traditions, the culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. So, as I said, welcome to the first of two sessions with Rivka. We're hoping to run this as a very interactive session. So we would ask you actually to turn your cameras on if you wouldn't mind, please. Uh, we don't mind at all if you're having your lunch. Uh, we appreciate it is lunchtime and, um, and so would would love to be able to, to, to see people. Um, and, um, and, and we will... Thank you, everybody. Um, so the, the session today is, as I said, <laughs> an opportunity to do some networking and for it to be very interactive. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Rivka Hagen. So Rivka is a fervent champion of excellence in primary care uh, business management. With a foundation as a medical scientist, she transitioned to general practice management and accreditation surveying since 20, uh, 2000. Rivka successfully managed medical practices of all sizes, driven by deep passion for leadership and development, coaching, quality improvement, governance, business planning, and financial management. As the director of business management services and business, sorry, medical business coaching, Rivka delivers consulting, advisory, coaching, training, and mentoring services to Australian health sector, encompassing community health, general practices, Aboriginal health services, and primary health networks. Rivka's expertise extends to board directorship in the community health sector, and is currently serving on the board of IPC Health. She is co-host of MedCube's podcast and founder of the influential Facebook group, Practice Managers Network, which has a global membership exceeding 12,000 people and creates a vibrant community dedicated to advancing practice management. We're very excited to have Rivka do a, a she's doing three um, sessions for us, two in this program, which are for practice managers, this one about uh, incentives and the next one, which is in September, all around accreditation. And she's got a lot planned today. It is an interactive session. So we do ask you to, to feel free to eat your lunch. We know there's lots going on. We, we're happy for that. But if we'd love you to leave your camera on and, uh, and I'll hand over to Rivka. Welcome and thank you. 
Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, uh, Jennifer, and uh, hearty hi to you all. It's really great to kick off a new series of practice management collaboration uh, with you guys. It's going to be a reasonably small group today, and uh, I'm so excited to have a bit of a yarn with you all about the Practice Incentives Program and then just a little bit of the detail around the uh, QI PIP and the Indigenous Health Incentive as well. So like uh, Jennifer said, it would be great. Let's um, just kick straight into you know, some housekeeping here. I'm sure you can see my, um, my slides uh, share on your screen here. I'd love for you to keep your camera on. And mostly that is so that we can have a bit of a conversation. So this is not intended to be the stock standard webinar type format that you will probably be very used to with lots of educational events where you're kind of a bit of a passive um, uh, passenger along that journey. I really want to have a chat with you guys. So if I can see you and I can see you react to what we're talking about, then we can actually have a little bit of a conversation. So you're going to be talking to me and talking to uh, your fellow guests here today as well. So um, Amila, if uh, you do have access to your camera as well, would love to see you. There is someone called iPad2. I don't know who you are. <laughs> so again, if you uh, can turn on your camera, we really don't mind where you are, whether you're at home or whether you're in the office. Um, and like Jennifer said, if you're having some lunch, that's perfectly fine too. So eat away, drink away, all of that is perfectly fine by me. Um, and I'm looking forward to having this uh, discussion with you now. I will caveat this session uh, today to say that we are likely going to run a little bit over time because there is a lot of content that I'd like to get out to you. And uh, depending on how interactive you guys are with me, that might just stretch it out a little bit. I totally understand if you need to leave on the dot um, at one o'clock and the session is being recorded so that if you do need to dash out, you'll be able to view whatever you've missed out on and anyone who just couldn't make it today, um, you know, is able to tap into that as well. And I can also see on my screen, oh, Rennie, thank you for uh, turning on your camera. That's really lovely. Um, and I can see Cassandra um, as well. Again, if you want to just turn on your camera and um, look, what I would say to you too is if you've got something that you want to add into the conversation as we're going through, uh, just pop up your hand or uh, simply turn on your microphone and start talking, right? So this is really informal, meant to be friendly, meant to be low key. And I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts as we go along. So I can see you all coming on camera, which is just really, really lovely. Now, secondly, if you would like to put your contact details into uh, the chat box, that would be um, that would be really terrific. If you are keen to chat with some of the members who are in the group today outside of this particular forum. If you say, oh, look, you know, now I've met you, now I know who you are, I'd love to have a chat with you um, at another time. If you put your contact details in, it just kind of implements this sort of networking notion that we'd love to foster within this, uh, this group as well. A little bit about Chatham House rules. So we want to ensure that we feel safe um, and secure in discussing whatever it is that's bothering us. Or if you would like to talk a little bit about what's happening in your practice with regard to these particular programs, Chatham House rules means that what we discuss within the group pretty much stays within the group. So a little bit of privacy um, boundaries around that will be very much appreciated by um, everyone. And like I said, the meeting is being recorded. So to kick us off, before we get into the grunt work of the Practice Incentives Program, I'd love to just hear from you all. If you'd like to just sort of introduce yourself, we can see most of your names, but uh, give us your full name, the practice that you uh, are at, what your role is within the practice, because that may vary as well. And uh, just to kind of lighten the mood a little bit is, um, you know, tell us a little bit of a win uh, that you've experienced recently, what's gone well, or what are you proud of? What's kind of making you go, yeah, we did that, related to your practice work. So in no particular order for me, Leanne Dixon, I'm going to start with you. If you want to unmute and uh, just introduce yourself, that'd be great. Good morning, everyone. So my name's Leanne Dixon. I am at Culture Super Clinic, and I'm the practice manager here. 
And my win is that we utilise the online um, platforms, which has we can send out our remit invoices to patients by SMS, which keeps our debtors down. So that yeah, that's a great win. win. So beautiful that we, I've got stars in the background for exactly that kind of progress love that example that's great to hear it uh, welcome Leanne Thank you. Uh, Rennie, I'll ask you to unmute and uh, do a similar type of introduction hi good afternoon everyone uh, my name is Rennie Zachariah I am the practice manager of smart clinics here at Tuwong in Brisbane uh, just like how Leanne said, always we are in Tuong. We are welcome to new ideas, especially anything related to IT and techno, which can make life easier for the front desk. Uh, we use HotDoc and have pretty much used, are uh, using everything on that platform, like the online script request, uh, auto collection. So yes, I try to get my debtors and health um, invoices down. Fabulous, uh, which we've got a real financial focus opening today. I love that. Uh, Cara, nice to meet you too. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Cara. I'm the um, practice manager here at Gas Oaks Medical Practice in at Newstead. Um, so my little win recently, I would say I've started utilising um, chat GPT for um the wording that I'm using for my quality improvement. So I think I've previously sort of tried to stick to the PHN format and found that uh, I find it hard to use, whereas I've started trying to um, implement it into a Word document, into a format that I actually like and use utilising their service to sort of uh, make it flow, make it a, a nicer sort of setup. Ah, I'm so glad that I asked you all to nominate some of these wins because there's some real gold coming out of this meeting already. Again, not related to practice incentives program, but uh, I love that. I will absolutely declare I'm a bit of a chat GPT uh, girl myself as well, and I am totally into any kind of tech use to make my life uh, easier too. So, yeah, well done. Love to hear that. Uh, Sarah, I think we're seeing a, a roof or, or a ceiling for you. I wonder if uh, if you're present, if you would like to unmute as well. Oh, we can see something happening on the screen there. Hi, Sarah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Have I got a bad angle? Uh, well, we, we just can, can you see, see something me? very blurry. We can't see you. We're seeing something blurry, but we can certainly hear you. Oh. So don't worry too much about the vision. Tell us a bit about yourself. Sorry. So it looks like um, your camera's so actually around the other way. Um, That's okay. Don't, that don't worry about you can you can worry about that. Uh, just yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm Sarah. I'm at Wellsby Parade Medical Centre on Bribe Island. Um, I'm not actually the practice manager yet, but I am working alongside the practice manager to assume that role later this year. Um, and I've been undertaking various training um, schedules and that's why I'm signing up for this and anything else that I can get my hands on just to um, absorb as much as I possibly can. So in terms of your question, um, you know, what's your win? Probably... I, I, I'm not privy to everything right now, but, you know, for myself, it's just everything that I'm managing to learn, take on board, print, read. Um, that's just my mission and my goal at the moment, just to take on as much as I can. Uh, look, lo lovely feedback and welcome. Um, and you're absolutely in the right space to learn a little more as well. So again, this is why I'm just so pleased to be asking everyone around, what are you doing? What's your role? Just so that we've got a really good grasp of who's in the room. Um, Sarah, I'm going to have some more. Oh, we can see you really clearly now. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, I'm going to have a bit more information for you right at the end of uh, today's Lunch and Learn about some other networking and learning opportunities for you as well, besides the sort of the three-part series that's part of where we are uh, today as well. Yeah. So stay tuned for that. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Amila, I might come to you. Again, uh, we can't see you, so not sure whether you've got a camera available or even whether you can connect your microphone. If you can, just speak up. I'll just give you a moment to see if you can work that out. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to come to 
Cassandra, um, maybe if you don't have a camera, then we can hear you anyhow. So I think you've just unmuted. So welcome, Cassandra. I have. Hello, everybody. I'm Cassandra. I manage Corrie Street Medical Clinic in Chermside. Um, we also have a specialist centre and a skin cancer clinic and a physio centre. So I think my greatest achievement is... I'm still trying to work that out, actually. Um, <laughs> some days I think it's getting up in the bed and actually going to work. And other days it's, you know, yeah, yeah, I've had a great day. Been doing yeah. this for a long time. Like everybody else, lots and lots of ups and downs. Yeah, so. absolutely. Uh, Cassandra, did you have a camera available as well to just come and join us visually as well? Or are you not hooked up? Well, I have looked for it. I've got a new iPad mini. I brought myself as my treat for work. I can't okay. find it. <laughs> so on, on your Zoom panel, there should be a little button for video. Um, no, uh, I'm looking. Okay. It may require oh, an update to your Zoom software on your iPad, but um, it's okay. Yeah. Um, have a little play with it. If not, um, maybe you see if at the next meeting you're able to get that going. Yes. We can I will have it worked the, out for the um, next one. You might want to either use sort of the hand symbol to let us know if you want to say something or, like I said before, just turn on your mic and just come and join the conversation. All of that is uh, fabulous. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, kind, uh, got a thumbs up, so that's cool. We're kind of ready to uh, to get started. So there's going to be just sort of a bit of didactic information coming through. For some of you, none of this will be um, sort of, you know, particularly new or exciting. And for others, um, for the likes of... Um, uh, of Sarah, who is newer to uh, to the role, you might kind of go, oh, look, I'm just not familiar with any of this. So just take out of this what you will. There will be some links and resources at the end for you to snap with your um, with your camera. So maybe if you've got your mobile phone ready at hand as well, so that later on you can take some of the QR codes and sort of get some of the resources that um, I'll be talking about as well. That will be really helpful. So let's kick off with the uh, the QI pips. So this is the quality improvement practice incentives program, and we're kind of jumping straight into the meat and bones of this incentive program which is all around sub programs that provide financial benefits to practices for undertaking specific activities and so some of these sub programs that's what we're talking about so the overarching program has detail to it as well but we just don't have enough time to the big overview of the entire program to give you a better view of that. So we're going to be talking about just two of the sub programs today, knowing there are others that we're not going to cover off on today. So the Quality Improvement Practice Incentive Program has been around for oh, quite a few years now. Um, it did replace some other programs that sort of preceded it quite a few uh, years ago. And the intent around that was that the government through Medicare and the Practice Incentives Program wanted to get a better feel and look of uh, population health and get a better grasp of how we are faring on a population level. And in order to do that, uh, the government really needs the data that uh, practices have within their control through the services that they provide to patients. And so by starting this process of um, the, looking at de-identified data, so this particular program requires um, a data download to be submitted to your PHN, and it is de-identified, so patient names are not included on this, but it gives that baseline data of how is the population faring on a number of health metrics. And out of that, uh, we are looking at some very specific areas in that for improvement and for focus, because we know these are the highest priority health pr uh, priorities, I guess, for the government to be able to, uh, to work with. So this is an outcomes-based program. What you need to do is, um, if you are not already participating in this particular program, uh, then you need to contact your PHN. And I suggest that Jennifer would be a great person to have a talk to about that. And I can see her nodding. 
to commence the data submission. So there's a bit of sort of technical setup that's required uh, for that to get that established. But usually once that's going, um, it's kind of a little bit of set and forget. And these things tend to happen automatically in the background. And you will receive data reports as a result of that data extraction that takes place. And you'll see some very interesting information in terms of how your practice is performing and comparing that to other practices uh, within your catchment and more uh, sort of nationally as well. So there's some really nifty data that comes out of there. You uh, need to, if you're not already participating in this pr uh, program and you are eligible for the Practice Incentives Program, you've got to sign up to this QIPIP program through PRODA. So um, there's a, quite a few steps that you need to go through th to that to kind of kick off the program participation in the first place, because of course, at the end of all of this, we want to ensure that you're able to receive some of the funding that is uh, attached to this. And um, so, you know, if you don't participate in the program, then, you know, you're kind of not going to go anywhere out of that. You then need to look at uh, collecting and reviewing that specific clinical data. And again, the PHN will be a great help to get you uh, started on that. And different PHNs will have different data interfaces that allow for that data extraction to happen. Uh, so some of the you know, more common data extraction programs are PENCAT, Polar, and Primary Sense. So these are three different ways in which the PHN can intersect with your, uh, your data to obtain that data set. And then that data is submitted quite automatically to, uh, to your PHN. So that's you know, some of the early parts that you, you need to undertake. But the really important part of participate, participating in this program is to kind of work out the so what behind this. What we're trying to do is we're trying to look at data measures that are going to shift the dial forward in terms of our health management for patients in our catchment and looking at sort of the global picture of where are we doing well what else could we be doing? But it all starts with submitting what we call clean data. So we need to start off by looking at our data quality at that baseline level. So are we um, you know, coding our conditions? Are our doctors coding conditions? That will make a really big difference to the quality of uh, the data that's coming out. Um, do you have duplicate patients? Is your database a bit messy? Do you have key items of your data that is missing, you know, whether it's dates of birth or other metrics that just make the data not as valuable as what it could be? So that's a fantastic first quality improvement activity for your practice to undertake. Look at how good is our data? And if it isn't great, uh, you're not alone, right? This is really very common. Start small, you know, all of this sort of quality improvement work, it's a big elephant and you need to take small bite-sized pieces to move the dial. When you look at some of the data that comes out of this extraction software, you can very easily get a bit overwhelmed by how much is in there and how much it's telling you, and then getting lost in the, oh my gosh, where do we go from, um, you know, from here? So again, I would suggest, um, you know, not knowing what your data is looking like, a perfect activity to really involve your PHN with to kind of make sense of your baseline data and help you prioritize what do you need to do first. So deactivating non-active patients. So if patients have not attended in a two-year period, make them inactive on your system so it's not going to mess up your data extracts. Uh, merging duplicates, looking at clinical coding, if that's being applied in um, inconsistently at the outset, that's a great conversation to have with your doctors uh, to, uh, to start improving the capture of that data. So I think, um, you know, that's probably giving you an indication of, of where you might want to be focusing on. There's a list of 10 metrics here of the information that is submitted through that de-identified data. I won't read through the whole list, 
Uh, but for example, it's the proportion of patients with diabetes that have a current hemoglobin A1C result. The, propor the proportion of patients with a smoking status, the proportion of patients with a weight classification, and so on. So if you are familiar with those 10 metrics, it gives you a really good idea of where the government would love for you to focus your attention if you're looking at improving health outcomes. These are the areas you want to look at. So you don't need to get massively complicated about it. Look at diabetes, look at capturing smoking information, looking, look at you know, capturing weight information on patients, look at your immunization status, especially um, influenza and the like etc. Those are your early priorities for going, where can we get things happening um, uh, more nicely? So that's the data that is pr uh, provided. So then you can set improvement targets in conjunction with the PHN, make them realistic and achievable, right? So think of that elephant, you know, take a bit of the tail, just don't try to chew out too much at the one time because you will get overwhelmed and you will lose momentum and kind of go, oh, it's all too hard. So chunk it down into something that you go, when I come to my next lunch and learn, this can be your win. It's a small uh, target improvement, not a massive one. So that's one of the key takeaways for today as well. And what you're going to do is going to vary practice to practice. It depends entirely on your starting point, um, you know, how much other activity in terms of quality improvement you've undertaken and what you would like to achieve next. So it's really difficult to give you concrete examples of you know, what would be good for you. You need to think about what would be most appropriate for um, your practice. And then um, the improvement activities, you know, there's certainly a push towards capturing them. And this is not just for this particular incentive program. The quality improvement activities that you will undertake, um, for most PHNs, you are not, uh, absolutely required to submit them to the PHN as such. And again, I'm not entirely sure what that looks like for Brisbane North. Uh, Jennifer, if you want to uh, pitch in and, and let me know, uh, you know are you actually uh, capturing quality improvement plans for this particular program um, at this stage? <laughs> I'm sorry, it took me a while to figure out how to unmute. Um, okay. The, the quality improvement plans are, are not captured as such. Um, we, yeah. we do I... uh, encourage um, practices to work with their engagement officers to develop yeah. plans. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you're probably going to go on to Rifka. We can certainly help with the development of that. And, um, and uh, uh, Rifka, are you going to talk about what areas those plans can be around? Uh, look, not specifically. Again, we've got a okay. lot of content to get through. Yeah. So, okay. Well, um, look, I'll, 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 I'm, I'm making some notes, so I'll, yeah. I'll make some comments at the end if that's okay. I'm, yeah, I'm making a few notes. Cool. Perfectly All right. fine. Thanks. So what Jennifer is describing is really common across the board that you don't actually need to um, submit your improvement plans as part of the practice incentive program eligibility and outcome payments, you only need to submit the, the identified data, which kind of happens uh, automatically. But there is a double up, right? There may come a time where you do need to submit that, but it is absolutely aligned with your accreditation requirements as well. So if you think about your RACGP accreditation, where you are required to actually develop a quality improvement plan for uh, your practice, it's one and the same thing. These are not different things. So do it once and it's across the board for accreditation and for the practice incentives program as well. All right, so then we come to the payment. That's the exciting bit for uh, the practice owners, of course. Uh, when you participate in this program based on your SWIPIs, the standardized whole patient equivalent, again, I won't go into the detail of exactly what all of that means, but it's a measure of the size of your practice the number of GPs and the number of services that your practice provides over a period of time is where the uh, the SWIPI will ultimately land. And based on that, you will be paid $1.25 per quarter to a maximum of $12,500 per quarter or $50,000 a year. Now, for really small practices, uh, you will not have the SWIPI size 
to be able to achieve $50,000 a year. So it's absolutely related to how big your practice is. But at a point where your practice is big and then gets bigger, beyond that $50,000 a year, you're not going to get additional funding. So it is capped at that level. Uh, there is rural loading that applies uh, if you are in a more regional or rural environment. That's the practice incentives program as far as quality is uh, improvement is concerned. I'm going to pause for just a moment before we kick off into the Indigenous Health Incentive and just see if anybody's got any burning questions or comments on what I've just talked through. Yes, no? Nope, everyone's quiet. Okay. Then we will uh, we will move on. Okay, so now the second program that we're going to be talking about today is the Indigenous Health Incentive Program, um, and this one has more complexity to it really than what the QI PIP does. So we'll spend a little bit more time on this as well. So it consists of a sign-on payment, which is a one-off thousand dollar, like a grant payment per practice once off. Once a practice has received that, you will not ever be eligible to receive that again. And when you sign up to the Indigenous Health Incentive, like the QI PIP, that needs to be done through PRODA by saying we would, you know, we're would signing up for this program. What that means is that you are agreeing to undertake specific activities to improve the care that you provide to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients with chronic conditions. So that's in a nutshell, the aim of the program. It is part of the, um, the uh, Closing the Gap program. And like I said, it's a one-off payment and that will fund some of the early activities that you need to undertake in order to remain eligible for this uh, program. So as part of that sign-on agreement, uh, you are agreeing to seek the consent to register eligible patients for this particular sub-program and or for the PBS co-payment program. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, program in a moment as well. What you are also agreeing to do, and this is important because this bit sometimes gets forgotten by practices, is that you agree to ensure active follow-up of patients, Indigenous patients in this instance, with chronic diseases. So you need to ensure that your recall and reminder system is active and it is in place for Indigenous patients who are enrolled to this program for your practice. It's important that you remember that. We also need to ensure that the practice has uh, had uh, cultural awareness training undertaken by at least two staff members and one of them needs to be um, a GP. There are some exceptions, um, you know, for very small practices. If, you know, you only have one GP, then um, you only need one person to undertake this cultural awareness training. And there are certainly exceptions to cultural awareness training if your organisation is already an Aboriginal health service. So, you know, your focus is very much towards uh, this patient cohort. So uh, this uh, training doesn't need to be undertaken because it's um, it's pretty superfluous for those kinds of services. And that training needs to be approved by the RACGP or uh, NACHO, the uh, National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisations, a bit of a mouthful there. Um, so again, your PHN will be able to help you find and source uh, cultural awareness training if you are just signing up to this program and you need to do this. You've got 12 months from the time of signing up to the program to provide the evidence that uh, the training requirements have been undertaken. Furthermore, as far as the sign-up agreement is concerned, uh, you will need to ensure that you annotate scripts for patients who are registered with the PBS co-payment uh, incentive and that's usually done very simply through your practice uh, software by putting a tick in the box uh, that relates to the PBS um, uh, co-payment program. And usually once that's done per patient, it's kind of set and forget. It just needs to happen that once and it will continue to provide that eligibility for uh, subsidised scripts. Really important uh, to remember that 
the uh, Aboriginality or Torres Strait Islander uh, identification is self-identified by the patient. As a practice, you are not required to cite any uh, evidence other than the patient's nomination that they identify uh, as an Indigenous uh, community member. And again, this is aligned to RECGP standards. And in this case, it's the core standard, um, the uh, indicator 7.1, which is mandatory that your practice routinely records the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander status of patients in their health record. So again, you can see that duality between um, compliance with the practice incentives program, but also being a core accreditation requirement there as well. So uh, those two are linked. So as far as the PBS co-payment measure is concerned, you've got the tick in the box of your practice management software. What that means is, um, you know, that the patients uh, who have a chronic condition or a risk factor uh, are registered for the program. They are then entitled to a reduced fee for scripts. So for private patients, if they are not concession patients, they will uh, be able to purchase their script at the concession rate. So that's for non-concession Indigenous health patients who are registered to, to this program. So that's a big money saving for them. And for concession patients, so that's healthcare card holders uh, and pensioners, the uh, they're able to get their medication at no charge. So that's really fantastic as well. Like I said, that's a one-off uh, registration. So it's a really good benefit for, uh, for our Indigenous community. Then we go on to the, uh, pay, the patient registration payment. And there is a bit of complexity in this because it has changed since uh, January last year, and it continues to change in the middle of where we are right now. So the program is changing because, um, you know, there used to be a, um, a $250 payment for registering the patients onto the practice incentives program. And that's an, that was an annual payment. So every time the patient would get registered and it required an active process of registration, the practice would receive, you know, quite a sizable sum of money for that registration process. There are sort of, you know, requirements that come in after that. But what we were finding is that practices were just registering patients and then not doing anything. And so the government's kind of gone, yeah, that's actually not the point of the program. We want patients to register because we want them to access health services to help them get better, stay better and live healthier lives. That's kind of the whole purpose of uh, the program. So that's why the changes are happening now. And what they're doing is they're reducing the registration payment down back in January last year, it reduced down to $150. From the 1st of January this year, it's reduced down further to $100. And at the end of this year, there will be no more registration payment. Cassandra, come and join the conversation. Yeah, I was just going to point out, I think one of the difficulties in the past with getting the um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait health assessments done is that when you go, you book your patient in, um, in the morning, you go and check it on Proda and it's been done elsewhere, even though they're your regular patient. So it's been, I think, the most practices really, really difficult. Yeah, look, I hear what you're saying, uh, Cassandra. This is just a really common um, situation. I guess uh, we can sort of start to lean into the space of my Medicare registration now as well, because these programs are going to become, um, I guess, ring fenced. So for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander patients, in addition to what we're talking about here, you want to ensure that you start registering them through the My Medicare system because it's going to stop that from happening yeah. down the track. It hasn't stopped it just yet, but it will do so in future. So the more proactive you can be about getting them onto the My Medicare system so that you don't get that leakage of work being done elsewhere, that's going to be your protective uh, factor there. But, yeah, I totally uh, recognise what you're saying there. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, that's I'm sure a fabulous we'll idea. Thank you. 
Yeah, no, no, look, you're welcome. So at the end of this year and then from the 1st of January next year, there will be no registration payment happening anymore. But the really good thing is that at the moment, the registration process is an active process where you need to actually register the patient through ProDial or through paperwork. It's just quite a bit of a, um, a, an, a an administrative burden. From the 1st of January, that annual registration won't need to happen. So the patients will be automatically registered for the program and all you need to focus on is the service provision that comes after that. So there will be a simpler way to manage this. And don't be concerned about the fact that I'm showing you that the registration payments are whittling down to nothing at all, because where you're going to lose out on the registration patient, uh, payment, you're going to make up for when you are delivering the services. So there is no, um, well, there, there, there was initially a $100 change to the overall a payment opportunity for the program. But from here on in, there is no loss of totality of funding. It's just going to be done in a slightly different way. So the patient registration, uh, some of the other changes that happened is that in the past, it used to be uh, that patients needed to be aged over uh, 15 to be able to come onto this registration program. This is no longer the case. So really anyone with any sort of chronic conditions or risk factors for, and it'd be, you'd be hard pressed to find um, too many that don't have at least some of these risk factors uh, associated um, you know, with, with their experience. And, um, you know, so you can register them until the end of this year onto the program. You are required as part of the registration to offer a 715 health assessment. So it should be part of the service offering. However, it isn't mandatory. So if the patient says thanks, but no thanks, that's okay. It doesn't mean that the patient is ineligible to remain on the program. So that's really important to remember. However, the 715 health assessment is a golden opportunity to do some really great clinical work with the patient, really sort them out and get them established on a really good sort of therapeutic pathway there. So we'll talk a little bit more about that um, at the moment. Um, okay, so then the MBS program eligibility around the 715 health assessment is um, that when you undertake this health assessment and there are different uh, templates or different assessments that you would undertake depending on the age group of the patient. So if they're a younger person, the assessment, the 715 health assessment that you undertake is going to look different and it will have a different focus than if you are doing a 715 health assessment for, say, a 50-year-old uh, Indigenous patient. There are lots of templates available and they are uh, pretty much, I guess, mandated uh, through Medicare that you use the right assessment for the right type of patient and it will guide you through there. Nurses are absolutely able to assist with undertaking a lot of the measurements and the data collection for undertaking uh, this health assessment. However, the GP definitely does need to be involved in that. Ruth, can now, I, I interrupt you for just yes, a moment? Of uh, Cassandra's had a hand up for the yeah, last couple um, of slides. No, I think she hasn't quite taken it down yet. Am I right, Cassandra, or do you have something else to contribute? Sorry, I forgot to take my hand oh, down. Okay, okay. My I'll try and work out how to do it now. Sorry, I, just, I didn't want to get you too far ahead and then to go back. My Thanks. I, th I think Sorry. if you press the icon again, Cassandra, it will um, it will come down. So uh, so that will, yeah, there you go. You've done. You know, thank you. So that's that's great. Uh, but feel free to come back into the conversation at any time. And again, just extending the invite out to anyone to kind of go. Oh, pause there for a moment. Tell me more. I'm not quite getting that. This is what this conversation's all about, right? So the seven one five health assessment um, is uh, a prolonged. It's a beefy assessment. But the Medicare rebate uh, for it is also quite generous. So the GP and the practice is quite well rewarded for undertaking this assessment. It's over $250 for uh, this assessment alone. So it's really worthwhile for that perspective. Now, the other benefit out of 
undertaking that 715 health assessment. And the 715, uh, possibly mostly for your benefit, Sarah, is the Medicare item number that is attached to that particular uh, service and yeah, for anyone else who can benefit from that. But out of that, once that health assessment has been undertaken, it means that uh, the patient is eligible to receive five visits uh, by an Aboriginal health worker or uh, allied health uh, professional using the item numbers between the 81300 and 81360 for specific um, you know, allied health or Aboriginal health worker uh, services tied to the 715 health assessment. It stands alone. And for those allied health professionals and the Aboriginal health worker services, the rebates that they receive for undertaking those uh, support services is higher than the equivalent ones that are attached to care planning items like the team care arrangement, um, you know, allied health visits that are attached to that. So that's additional service opportunity coming out of the 715 that you would want to use first and foremost before you look at any other care planning service opportunity there because it pays better and um, it means that you have additional service opportunity for patients that likely could really benefit from additional services. There is a specific referral form that is attached uh, to these referral pathways. So it's not the same as the refer the EPC referral that you would use for the 723, um, you know, the team care arrangement referrals to Allied Health. It's a different one that you need to use. Um, but again, the template is available. Once you've got it in your system, it's very easy to use. In addition to that, there are also... Um, uh, th there is the availability of up to 10 services per year under item number 10987. So these are the nurse services to support a patient who's had a 715 health assessment. Um, and again, if the language of that sounds really similar to the 10997 that you are probably more familiar with through the team care arrangement and the GP management plan pathway, it's because the wording is kind of exactly the same. So uh, these patients are again eligible for additional services and the rebates for the 10987s are double that of the 10997. So again, this is another reason why you don't want to forget about the 715 health assessments because it opens up that whole pathway towards service provision for this patient cohort rather than um, just kind of, you know, I guess leaning back onto the GP management plan, team care arrangement type of pathway. So I hope that's clear that the 715 is a really rich opportunity for support services um, and assessments for Indigenous patients. And then, of course, there is more to that as well. For patients who have identified chronic conditions, of course, they are also eligible to receive GP management plans and team care arrangements with the usual service provision that comes along with that. So the five 10997 services and the five allied health services that come along with that. And you can see um, for the allied health services, the item numbers that uh, they would use are a little bit different from the ones that come out of the 715 health assessment. So in a nutshell, it's about double the service eligibility that these patients can, uh, can tap into. So that's really great. Now, how does all of that relate back to the practice incentives program, you may well ask? And it is because you your practice will be rewarded for undertaking activities with your Indigenous patients. So although there will be in future no more payment for the registration, these are the payments that the practice is entitled to receive if you undertake the following activities. So you need to essentially provide two care planning type of services per year for Indigenous patients. That could consist of um, a GPMP plus or minus a TCA. So the two of them together is not going to count as two. It's going to kind of count as one eligible service component. 
plus you need to do one review of GPMP or TCA, or you could do both. Um, so a care plan plus a review is eligible for the tier one outcome payment. And that tier one outcome payment is per completed, um, I guess, episode per patient. So it depends on how many uh, Indigenous patients you have enrolled to the program. And then for each of those patients, are you able to match uh, this sort of service provision. So that's how that works. The other um, way that you could run this is if the patient already has a care plan in place, then um, you could just simply do two GPMP or TCA reviews per year. So claim item number 732, which is the review of a GPMP or TCA, and do that twice a year and you will achieve the tier one outcome payment for that patient. You could do two TCA reviews, exactly the same. So two times 732 item number claims. In addition, there were some other changes that happened uh, fairly recently. And that is that now uh, the provision of mental health treatment plans are also eligible to be counted towards this eligibility for tier one and for tier two outcome payments. So if the patient has a health, mental health care condition rather than an other um, chronic condition, you could use the mental health treatment plan and then a review to count towards this uh, tier one outcome payment. And again, if a plan is already in place, you will also achieve the outcome by simply doing two mental health treatment plan reviews per year. So I hope that kind of gives you all of the various ways in which you can achieve this tier one, $100 per patient, um, and that's unchanged from what it was previously, outcome payment per patient. So that's on top, of course, of the Medicare rebates that you will get for actually undertaking the work. And then there's more. There is also a tier two outcome payment. And what you need to do is um, you need to provide some additional services. So you need to provide a minimum of five eligible services to the patient. So there needs to be um, at least five service points throughout the year in order to achieve the tier two outcome payment. And this is kind of where the big dollars come in because this is what the government, the government wants us to do. They want us to provide a wraparound and consistent proactive care program for our Indigenous patients. And that can consist of professional attendances, so just consultations, so items level B, C, D, E um, consultations will count towards that. Uh, procedural items will count towards that. All the services that you've provided to achieve your Tier 1 outcome payment also fit into that. So the two services that you've already provided to get to your $100 Tier 1 outcome payment start to form the basis of the Tier 2 outcome payment as well. So uh, again, mental health uh, services are included in this also. So out of the five uh, services that are then provided, if you achieve all of that, then the outcome payment at the moment, if you achieve that, is $200 per patient until the end of this year. Remember, at the end of this year, the registration payment disappears altogether, but we get another $100 in this Tier 2 outcome payment. So it's again, it's just shifting that balance to saying, can you do this for your Indigenous patients? And if you do, you're going to, you know, we're going to really applaud that and give you some financial recognition um, for doing that. So again, I'm just going to pause there for a moment and see if there's any, um, any thoughts or any clarification that you, uh, you would like to see on that. I've stunned you all into silence. What's going on, guys? <laughs> All right, I'll take that as meaning that um, you're clear about what I've told you so far. So the summary then of the uh, the Indigenous Health Incentive and the changes that have happened in the little table here, you'll see what happened um, sort of from January 
2023 onwards. We went from a total registration payment of 250, that's whittling down to 150. It is now uh, $100, uh, $100. From the 1st of November, registration is no longer required and into next year, you're not going to get paid anything for it. Your tier one outcomes payment are unchanged across the board and the tier two payment, you can see that increasing from 150 uh, up to $300 for a total outcome payment of $400 per patient per year. So um, I think I've kind of run through the bulk of uh, what that program is about. We're just kind of coming um, to the end of our time here. I'll try to sort of, you know, rush through that. Leanne, yeah, you've got a comment. I was just going to ask, on the previous slide for the mental health items, it yes. only had the 2712 and the 2717. Is it 2715? Because sometimes they may not do a long or prolonged mental health plan. Uh, I'm pretty sure they are included in that as well. So, yeah, thank, that's probably a good pickup. Um, I'll need to revise my, um, my slides on that. But, yes, my understanding is that it absolutely includes the uh, mental health treatment plan, you know, the actual creation of them as well. Okay, thank you. Yep, no worries. Okay, so, um, again, how do we keep track? We need to ensure that we've got good clinical uh, coding happening. We need to make sure that we data cleanse well. We need to make sure we've got our uh, recall and reminder systems going. If you're using sort of top bar or any of those other sort of, you know, um, uh, products like Cubico as well, they can be really helpful in identifying um, patient eligibility there as well. Um, and again, you know, tap into your PHN for um, the support uh, there as well. Okay, so searching for your um, your item numbers in terms of uh, eligibility, how do we find who's outstanding, who could we be tapping into? We can uh, look for those who've previously had item 715s, um, you know, claimed by the practice. If you haven't serviced them for a while, then that could be a really good opportunity. Look for care planning opportunities there as well. Mental health services, your 10987s and the like, you can just do data searches on uh, any of those services that have been claimed uh, in the past. You can also use clinical coding like, uh, you know, patients who are identified as Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander within your system and then have a look. What have we done with these patients? What's missing? How far off are we from claiming either a tier one or a tier two payment? And when I say claiming, that claiming process is completely inactive, as in you don't have to do anything for that. If you are registered to the program, Medicare will identify your eligibility for those. So it's just simply providing the services. That's all you need to do. And you will receive those uh, outcome payments, which will be listed in your uh, PIP statements. So you, your quarterly PIP statements will list every um, you know, patient that has become eligible for uh, different tier outcome payments and the like. And of course, none of this is uh, particularly easy. And again, this is the reason why uh, a fair few dollars are being thrown at this. Patient engagement can be really tricky for this, uh, this cohort. To get them in in the first place and then to keep them engaged with the service can be really challenging. And that's very true. I would encourage you to think about, um, you know, what is the patient getting out of the service? So we do know that, for example, with some Indigenous uh, health services, they um, are using other sort of, you know, honeypot approaches to get patients to come in to receive these services. And, you know, whereas that's one approach, I'd probably be more inclined to think about what's a really meaningful health service that the patient can tap into that's actually going to benefit them where they say, oh, that's really cool. I see what I'm getting out of this. 
and I can see why it's important that I keep engaging with the service in order to get better health outcomes. Again, not easy, not simple, but that's kind of where we want to get to um, in future. So delivering care that's meaningful to, to the patient, culturally appropriate, and that you've got sufficient, I guess, administrative uh, time allocated to actually uh, work this program. And that's not dissimilar to, I guess, what's happening to um, you know, chronic disease management services all around. Again, we're not going to dig into that today. We may get an opportunity to do that at another time. But you may see if you've seen some of the changes coming in through the My Medicare system for care planning, they look eerily similar to the entire program that I've just mapped out for you here, which is around service provision and outcomes achievement um, rather than you know, doing a, um, a care plan up front and then doing nothing more after that. We want that proactive ongoing care happening. And so you need to understand what are all of the claiming um, and program opportunities. So again, important to reflect back on items like the 10987s. How can you get your nurses more involved in that, in providing that? What training do we need to provide them to kind of say, oh, I understand that this is a claiming opportunity and how do we weave that into appointment identification and then the actual claiming that uh, happens after that. So there's a fair bit of sort of workflow uh, contemplation that you need to take place or that you need to undertake within your practice in order to keep to see those outcomes um, happening. All right, uh, just for a couple of seconds, I will leave you on this QR code page. This is just program guidelines for the two programs that we've just discussed today. The QI PIP on the left-hand side there and the Indigenous Health Incentive. There's a lot more to it. I really want you to go back to the source. You can certainly also, the links are also written uh, down below. You can just Google, right, in any browser if you put in Practice Incentives Program, uh, QI PIP or Quality Improvement or Indigenous Health Incentive, bang, you'll be right there. So there is no magic to this. This is very easy to find online. Okay, so then furthermore, um, and again, Sarah, this is possibly of interest for you and maybe to uh, any of you guys. Um, as part of the work that I do, I also uh, provide sort of monthly lunch and learn type of uh, opportunities. And this is across uh, Australia wide. So this is not, not sort of a PHN cohort, but it's across the board. I call the monthly, many month, many managed monthly meetups. So that's the four M's there, which is again about extending your networking, your learning, discussion and participation in anything and everything to do with practice management. Um, so the QR code on the right will take you to the link if you would like to register and, and participate in one of those. Uh, we usually have, I don't know, around 15 to 20 participants per month, sometimes more, sometimes less. It absolutely varies. But the focus of those meetings is around your issues. So today I've brought you a program of practice incentives program, but the Medi, um, Medi Managed Monthly Meetups are about what's on your mind, what's worrying you, where are your concerns, that's where we start. And so again, they're very interactive sessions. And when that conversation runs dry, I usually have a topic of the month as well. The next meeting is coming up next week, Thursday, if that's of interest to you. And my focus for that is on clinical and non-clinical risk management. It's a very small fee to participate in that, or you can get it as a freebie through um, a membership there as well. If you're interested in all of that, again, just the two QR codes will take you there if that's of interest to you. So furthermore... We've got two more sessions coming up. So the next Lunch and Learn sessions for Brisbane North are on the 11th of September for accreditation and the 23rd of October for developing nurse-led services. What I would love is if you guys are going to participate in that one as well is put on your thinking caps, especially for the September one. What are your questions around accreditation? 
hit me with your gnarly questions and I'll be very happy to address them. We'll look at sort of a basic overview of uh, what the accreditation process is all about. We'll dig into a couple of the different standards that um, tend to cause a little bit of concern and anything else that you uh, would like to talk about as far as accreditation is concerned. And then leading into developing nurse-led services, which is another you know, really cool topic around how we can um, better tap into a magnificent resource within our practice and um, uh, you know get that uh, humming as well. So I guess that's it for me. We're just we actually haven't done too bad as far as time is concerned. Um, I guess I want to open up the floor a little bit and yeah, maybe uh, just check in with you all and see what you're thinking, what your key takeaways are from what we've uh, talked about today. I'm going to, in, again, in no particular order, um, Cara, I might start with you. What What's going through your head? What's a key takeaway from the topics that have just been covered for today? Sorry, just not get. Sorry, not used to um, Zoom. Not a not All a good. Zoom fairly good. normally. Great. Um, <laughs> I would say for uh, me, I think a lot of our concern as a practice has been um, we haven't wanted to feel like it's a, a an opportunity to to um, grab money for um, for these sorts of things. I think our main goal and our main focus has been about patient care and how that. Um, how that looks here and how we would look at implementing that. So I think it's been nice to sort of touch on it in a way that doesn't feel um, not aligned with our values. I think a lot of the other sort of discussions out there about how to, how to navigate um, uh, um, ethnicity and Indigenous health and making it sort of um, connect with the patients and, and making it work for the doctors here at the practice that do just want to look after their patients. So I think for me, it's opening my eyes a little bit more to how we would do that in a way that's still authentic to what we're, we're sort of um, setting our goals towards. Uh, look, I think that's a lovely observation. Um, I guess I'm really aligned with what you're thinking as well in terms of, yes, this is important, of course, for practice viability, but the primary focus is on the healthcare and the quality of service provided. So I'm really glad that that really resonated with you as well. Thanks for that. Um, Renny, what about you? Um, I guess with the, the issue with me is we have very few patients who are actually Indigenous because of yeah. the demographics of the place. But I was just thinking, you know, while you were talking, like I really need to pull up data if I have missed anyone to do that small tick but most of the times the patients do come and say like I need to be registered for the co-payment and stuff but then I'm really not sure if the right boxes have been ticked uh, mm -hmm. we do the QI but this aboriginal thing I I think I must have done maybe one or two 715 yeah but I really have to look into a patient data and see and extract it to see if we have missed anyone or if they're not coming in so yeah, that's that will be my focus because I have to uh, do that first to get the rest sorted. Yeah, look again, um, lovely um, insight into that. What I would say is if you've got a really small Indigenous patient cohort, in a way it makes it simpler because you, you know you don't get overwhelmed with so many patients that you're just again not quite sure where to start so a small patient cohort is absolutely yeah. fine because yes. you can really refine yes. your systems around just a few patients and monitor them really carefully so i love your approach to again going what have i missed are there more and if not what else can we do to achieve those outcome payments and those outcome goals for those patients so yeah i think that's really great okay good stuff leanne what about you well i actually didn't know that the 15 minimum of 15 age requirement had been removed so that's actually really interesting because we had uh, patients who had signed up for it but didn't register them at all, knowing that it would come back with, oh, the patient's not eligible. So um, I think that's data I need to go back and have a look on. 
Great, great stuff. So that's a, a new little insight that's useful. Fantastic. And uh, finally, I see a couple of dropped off. I guess they've needed to dash off. It's uh, that, That's understandable. Uh, Sarah, but what about you? I hope I haven't totally bamboozled you with, uh, with the information provided. Hey, no, actually, I'm... I understood a lot of what you were talking about. Um, I, I've I've been in the medical centre for seventeen years anyway, so I've been. We're, we're actually quite proactive with registering our Indigenous patients, and I actually do all of the IHI registrations and co-payment ticks. And we've got a good system where even when new patients come on board and they've registered through hot docs, they may identify there. So we're capturing them quite early. Um, and then we're feeding that information through to the doctor, you know, like just to explore maybe the 715 early on. So yeah. um, I, the part that I um, learned something from was, um, again, um, I'm sorry, I forgot that lovely lady's name about the age limit has is not 15 anymore. I, I didn't know that, but I'll mention that to my practice manager. Um, okay. And also, I'm just scrambling around writing everything down with regards to all the um, tier one, tier two, just to make sure I've got that all in a line. Yeah. Um, so, so Sarah, I, I think it's great that, you know, you already have the basics of it because you're actively working in it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm hoping that by explaining the so what and what happens after that, that that really helps you to understand why we're doing what we're doing in the way that we are doing it uh, as well. And then, of course, some of the changes that are going to be coming up um, towards the end of this year, especially with the registration um, kind of, you know, falling uh, falling off there. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Great stuff. All right. Um, look, I think, Jennifer, we're probably ready to uh, wrap up for today. I want to thank you all for your interaction and, um, you know, for participating in today. I'm looking forward to seeing you again next month. In the meantime, if you want to come and join next week for the, the monthly meetup, you're very welcome to do so. If you've got any other questions, uh, I'm reasonably easy to find as well online through Facebook or um, email or through uh, the uh, Medical Business Services website. If you've got any other questions that you want to uh, throw at me, feel free to contact me in any of those ways as well. Uh, Jennifer, any final words from you? Uh, thank you, Rivka. That was a really um, comprehensive uh, presentation and, and particularly interesting um, a, a few things I wanted to flag was in terms of the, the PIP QI, the quality improvement payment, um, the, 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 there are 10 quality improvement measures and the, the, the incentive is paid to either work on improving data on that or any other improvement or practice improvement that is based on data. So um, your uh, QI and D engagement officers can help with plan so there are those 10 focus areas but you can do any improvement that's based on data that will actually influence your cohort so don't look at those 10 and think they're the only ways that we can do change to to qualify to meet the requirements for that payment there are lots of small changes that you can do that will have long-term value and add to your practice and as long as it's based on data about your patient cohort that's quality improvement um, and it doesn't have to be some big clinical audit. It can be a series of small improvements that you change to your day-to-day -day practices. And whoever uh, it was, I think it was Sarah, I think it was you that said you're, you're capturing um, First Nations ethnicity as they come in. That's a fantastic activity that you could do in other practices to help identify your cohort. And so that would be a great example of something possibly to do as a quality improvement for Rennie to kind of, um, make sure you're capturing it. So the, the, there's lots of options and PHN is always here to help. Um, I will, may well ring Cara with her permission because I love the idea of using chat GPT because it's anything that is improving the quality of your practices means that we are, everyone's healthcare outcomes are out are improving and that's always the, the goal of the PHN. Excellent. And I believe um, I believe you have a an evaluation that you will send through I, to I participants will. for today. Absolutely. Um, we'll so send, again, yeah. 
they will send through an evaluation for today. Uh, as Rivka flagged, there is another session uh, in four weeks time uh, on accreditation and it looks fantastic looking at um, planning risk management which I know is an issue that a, a lot of the accreditors have flagged the, the risk man management um, and as Rivka said some of the areas that that tend to be a little bit tricky um, our details are always there you're very welcome to give us a call and if you attend both of these sessions we will refund your hundred dollar a payment for the for the sessions and thank you again Rivka for a very comprehensive and, and interesting and interactive session and Fantastic. Um, and thank you all and I hope you have a nice afternoon can, you I, just, can I just sorry thank add, everyone sorry okay. that oh, survey sorry, you're right that survey will actually pop up as you leave the oh. session today oh, okay fabulous right, thank Thanks. you thank you everyone Bye. thank you